standing on the promises. Let's start. We'll sing the first, second, and the last. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises they cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God on the last. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen, amen. Well, I'm glad we're standing on the promises. That beats sitting on the premises any day of the week. But I'm glad we can stand on the promises of God. Amen. They are sure and steadfast. Amen. I'm glad you're here in the house of the Lord. My, this choir looks good this morning, don't it? Amen. All these folks in the choir? Yeah, that's right. Give them a hand. That's right. Amen. They look good. There's a few more out there. A few more of y'all out there. Boy, y'all look good out there, too. Amen. Sure do. It could be up here in the choir, but I'm glad you're here. All of you here, amen, in the house of the Lord. You glad you're here? Say amen. amen. Wonderful, wonderful. So good to be in the house of the Lord this beautiful day God's blessed us with. We got so much to thank him for, praise him for, and to adore him and just tell him. I'm telling you, let's do that right now. You want to? Let's do it. Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you. For being so good to us, you are so good to us in so many, many ways. Lord, I just want to praise you and say from my heart how grateful I am to be here in your house, to worship and adore you, Lord. I just want to stop for a moment and just think, Lord, each one of us, just stop for a moment and think about the glorious treasures we have in our lives to be blessed to come and worship you today. What an awesome joy, what an awesome privilege it is to come. To be able to come, Lord, to be able to have this freedom, and Lord, just to be able to come, and Lord, to have transportation, just to be able to come, and to be able to come to this beautiful house that you blessed us with, <laughs> the comfort, just to be able to adore you and worship you and just for a little while to forget all the other things that are happening just to think about how good you've been to us all the blessings that we have in this world in this life just to think about all the things that you've given us and lord just to think about most of all the greatest treasure lord eternal life And, Lord, just to praise you and adore you. Lord, we have so much to bless you for and to praise you for and to worship you for. Help us to do that this morning as we've gathered here to do. Lord, I pray, oh, Father, if there's one among us that don't know you or not where they ought to be with you, Lord, may this be the day, may this be the hour. You speak to all of us, but especially, Lord, you do a work in all of our hearts. We'd be changed by your power. We'd be conformed to your image. And, Lord, we'd just be transformed. Our Lord, as a result of being in your presence today as you were in ours. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Well, I'm telling you, it's always good to be in the Lord's house, but it's always good to be with his people when he's home. And I want to thank you so much for being here today. Amen. In his house. Remind you, of course, the evening worship service online tonight at 6. Don't forget that. And, of course, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here in our sanctuary at 7 o'clock, worshiping and studying the word of God together in that. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord together. That's what we come here for. Amen. So let's just worship the Lord together today. Let's just go to meeting this morning. Amen. Come on, Brother Daniel. Amen.
Let's stand as the choir comes down this morning. Tell of the story when thousands were fed, when he lifted the sick, when he raised up the dead. I could sing of the others like the blind made to see, but I'd rather tell you what's happened to me. Once I was lost, but now I am found in the book of life. My name's written down, now I'm part of the family, I'm a child of the King. This is the story, this is my song to sing. I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am. Washed in the blood of the precious Lamb, through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved. To the uttermost, you must be forgiven to make heaven your home. The good life you're living won't do it alone. So trust in the Savior and he'll save you today. And with blessed assurance, you too can say, I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious Lamb. Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved. To the uttermost, you're saved, sing it. I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious Lamb. Through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved. To the uttermost, through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Ghost, I'm saved to the uttermost. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you, Brother Daniel. Mighty good, mighty good singing this morning, mighty good songs we've had. Thank you, choir.
Amen. 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 Blessing our hearts this morning in song. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 14. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 14. I want to begin reading with verse number 13. Matthew 14, 13. Now, this is another event in the life of our Lord that we're looking at this morning. And, of course, we're going to see one of the most famous, I guess, of all the miracles that Jesus did while he was here upon this earth. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 14. This miracle, of course, is recorded in all of the Gospels. But I'm looking at Matthew, chapter 14, and verse number 13. If you're able and can, stand with me. We'll read down through verse number 21 <clears throat> for our hearing this morning. And then we'll examine these words of our Lord and Scripture and see, of course, this great, great miracle. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place. And the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves viticles or food. Verse 16, but Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Verse 20, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up all of the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you'd open our hearts and our minds to this, your holy word, and this great event that happened many years ago right here on planet Earth. And may we see by the power of the Holy Spirit the great, great truth that you have from us, not just from the depiction of this story, but what you have for us today from your word. In Jesus' marvelous name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Imagine it's supper time, and imagine there are about 5,000 people, hungry people, hungry men, that is, not counting women and children, and you're going to have to feed them. Would you count the microwaves? Would you start ordering pizza? What would you do if it's your obligation to feed that many people, and I've assisted my wife in feeding, feeding a great deal of people. Believe it or not, her and I one time were in the food business. Oh, I don't want to ever do that again, the Lord being my helper. Now, she's a great cook, 
And of course, she knows much about the food business. She worked in it for many years before she got in the accounting business. So she knows all about that. But what Jesus did on the account of this wonderful miracle of feeding 5,000 people, of course, is absolutely amazing. The setting of this particular miracle, of course, in verses 13 and 14, we're told, of course, that Jesus has taken his disciples to a desert place apart. He's trying to get them away from everybody. Of course, the tension is high. John the Baptist has just been slain, and the word reaches our Lord, and so he's taking his disciples away. He's taking them apart. It's good for us to get apart, get away for a little while. Vance Havner once said, you're either going to take a, a go apart or else you'll fall apart. It's good for you to take apart. You can be apart from the things of life sometime in life to get apart take a time of rest the disciples of the lord are away for a while trying to find some rest but of course the people wouldn't let him do that his popularity is now grown and jesus really didn't have any time to rest you study his life you study his ministry he find very very little time to rest people saw where jesus was going and the bible said in verse number 13 there they followed him on foot out of the city. They're following him everywhere he goes. And the Bible says that he had no rest for the Son of Man. Jesus said on one occasion, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He's constantly working. He's on a mission. The Lord Jesus came into this world to do a great work, to die on the cross. And as he's headed to pay the price for our sin, he's constantly working the work of him that sent him here to do that work that great work he's constantly doing it and the bible says the scripture says that when jesus saw the multitude he was moved with compassion there's that word compassion what does that word mean it means to suffer with that's literally what he's doing he sees the multitude and he's moved by them he's moved to the point that it brings about a heart compelling toward them his heart went out to them people look at folks for different reasons you know what i, I was amazed uh, this week i got a haircut can you tell i always kid my wife when i come in with a haircut i said well she says what i said well what i said well you didn't say nothing oh you got your haircut i said well you come in with yours done and i don't say nothing boy i'm in a world of trouble I come in with my cut and you don't say a word. Huh? Ah, we kid each other about that. Of course, we just go on. It's nothing real big or anything. But uh, you, you know how we are, men and women. You know how we are in our relationships. Uh, we want to see each other's and uh, our improvements, and we try to make improvements. I was amazed as I listened to my barber this week, and they was describing different people and inquiring about different people. And it was amazing. My barber was intrigued by or trying to listen to the description. She was asking about somebody, and, and uh, the lady has been cutting my hair since my boys was little. I've watched her grow up and watched her get married and watched her have kids, and now she's got a grandchild. And uh, 40, probably 40 years or better. Uh, and and same, 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 same lady. And she was describing uh, people by their hair. Amazing, that's how she watches people, by their hair. Of course, that's what she does for a living. You, you, you talk about other people, you know. Uh, I've been intrigued by different people over the years uh, by what they do. I knew a shoe salesman one time, he knew people by their shoes. You know, people that work on cars, they know them by their cars. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, really, a restaurant owner, and he knows people by what they eat. Amazing. Funeral director. Oh, boy. Uh, it makes you wonder what they're thinking. My wife's granddaddy, you know, he used to say that about Parnick Jennings. I don't shake hands with him. You ever noticed uh, Joel, he'd say, and I said, no, I had never noticed. He said, you shake hands with Parnick Jennings. He'll run his hand up your arm. I think he's measuring me. That's what he'd say. I said, oh, now I pick. And then we'd laugh about it, you know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, when Jesus looked at people, it was amazing what he saw in people. What do you see when you see in people? When Jesus looked at people, he saw their needs. He saw their needs. The Bible says he was moved toward the multitude because he saw their great need. He saw 
them and he had compassion upon them. He saw them in their need. It's the most uh, setting atmosphere here that the Lord sees people. Don't you see the multitude? The Bible said he went forth and he saw this multitude of people. 5,000, the Bible later tells us, of men. And of course, the scriptures say that the disciples said uh, to him, they don't have anything to eat. And of course, the Lord sees them. He sees them differently. He said they need to eat. The shortage of food is, uh, and the Lord's seeing these people differently. He sees people differently than you and I see people. Now, what a, pi what a picture the Lord is seeing here of hungry people. Now, there are some people who have physical needs. They literally do. We we hasten to try to meet needs of people who are physically hungry sometime. And I'm thankful for our church. And I, I see uh, people who have hunger needs. You know, we see them on television. Uh, little children who are starving. Boy, it breaks our hearts, don't it? It's hard for us to look upon those images of the insects crawling upon them and their eyes and uh, mouth. You know, it's hard to... Yeah, you don't even want to talk about it. Don't even want to try to imagine that today. Sometimes you'll turn your channel, won't you? You don't want to see that. But the awful tragedy of children hurting and children who are hungry. It's hard to see a child hungry. I'm talking about really hungry. Now, our kids get hungry sometimes, say they're hungry, but we know in reality they're not very hungry. They just want certain things. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know. I'm talking about real hunger, though. But we know there's some people that, even in the United States here, who are hungry, have hunger issues. I mean, really, we have a benevolence ministry, and I'm thankful for it, which primarily focuses on our membership. We want to make sure that all of the people, and especially here in our community, I try to see after people in our community that nobody goes hungry, and I try to minister to people. And, of course, I'm thankful for the ministries that we're involved in of feeding people. We support ministries right here in our county that feed people, literally hundreds of people in our county every month. And I'm thankful that our church supports that. We've had people in our church that's worked in those ministries before, and I'm thankful for that. We always have a heart of compassion that moves us toward meeting physical needs, and I'm thankful for that. Our heart goes out to those, those that have needs. People who have emotional needs, not just hunger needs, physical needs, but they have emotional needs. You realize some people have emotional needs, emotional hungers, hunger for acceptance that drives them to do sometimes uh, terrible things in their lives, but sometimes other things in their lives, emotional needs, some hunger for acceptance, some hunger for meaning and purpose in life. What's driving you in your life? Uh, many people have emotional needs. People walk the streets of cities and counties all over America with all kinds of needs that are not being met. Some people wonder why they're even born. Some people have no idea why they're on planet Earth. They have a hunger for love. They have a hunger for understanding in life. Emotional needs. Physical needs. But the greatest need that a person has is a spiritual need. You see, that's the reason Jesus came to this world. To meet that need, that hunger for forgiveness. A hunger for, the, the Bible talks about the sinner's need. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The guilt that goes with that sin that plagues every man, woman, boy, girl. I mean, and, and what they do, what? They try to snuff that out. They try to cover that out. It starts early in life and they have that guilt of sin. And then they start trying to hamper that and put that out and put that out of their minds and put that out of their hearts and cover that up to where it becomes so vague and it becomes so uh, callous that it doesn't bother them anymore. And cover it up to the point that they don't have a guilt anymore, don't have a conscience anymore, and then they don't have feelings anymore. Are they... Turn it towards something else and have compassion toward all other things in life instead of the right things in life. Oh my. They have the need to be clean, the need to be a brand new person, the spiritual needs, uh, the guilt of mankind, the guilt of people. Hunger. The Lord Jesus looked out over this multitude. He saw their hunger and he's moved with compassion. When you read the larger context of this miracle, which is found in the book of John... You'll find, of course, in John chapter 6, you'll find that their motives of these people of, of following the Lord 
wasn't really right. Just like people today. Come on. They're following the Lord. Why? To see what he's going to do next. What kind of miracle he's going to do next. Maybe he'll do a, some kind of special miracle. They saw the multitude. They saw the miracles that he performed. The Bible says in John chapter 6. And that's the reason they're following him. To see another miracle. They're looking for the show that he's going to do. Hmm. He really wasn't coming to Jesus for the right reason. And so then you have the critical spirit of some people that would say, well, if they ain't going to do it for the right reason, they don't deserve any help. Uh-oh. I hear people sometimes say that today. Well, we're not going to help people unless they deserve it. But if the Lord Jesus came with that approach, <laughs> we're all in a world of trouble. Can I tell you? Because didn't none of us deserve for him to die on the cross for us. But he did anyway. Thank God he did. Oh, I'm thankful that he did. Jesus didn't die on the cross because we deserved it. Jesus died on the cross uh, even when we didn't deserve it. The Bible says that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, I'm thankful that he loved me. Even when I was unlovable, we help people because Jesus loves them and Jesus can help them and Jesus can do something for them. That's the reason we help folks. Oh, not because they deserve it. None of us deserve it. None of us ever deserve the love that God showed toward us. None of us deserves the grace that he extends to us. Thank God that he does. In verse number 15, it says... But they came to Jesus and they said to him, Just send them away, Lord. Just send them away. That's the attitude of some folks. Most people don't want to be bothered with hurting people. Most people aren't interested in helping people that have needs whatsoever. Oh, just send them away, Lord. Oh, just send them away. Uh, most of us too busy, you know, just about our way. Uh, you know, messes up our plans. Uh, just send them away. Send them away. Uh, we got our own little red wagon. We got our own little problems. We ain't got time for everybody else's problems. Churches of the Lord Jesus today have done that a lot. You know, we'll give money and let somebody else take care of the problem. Oh, me, I'm glad we're not that way around here. We try to get involved in people's needs. We can't uh, do all the th solve all the world's problems, but I'm glad we, we can help them. We can tell them who can help them. Amen. I've told our people around here, there's, hey, don't ever say there's nothing we can do. There's always something we can do. We serve a God that can do something. Amen. Hey, man, God didn't ever turn nobody away. And we should not never. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, so the disciples said send them away. And I'm glad the Lord said, no, no. I'm telling you, when you and I have the answer to meet the needs, I'm telling you, we have the answers to meet the needs. We have the answers. Now, I didn't say we could solve all the world's problems, but I said we do have the answer. Jesus is the answer for all the world's problems. He is still the answer. He is. Do you still believe that? If you don't believe that, you ought to go home. Well, shut the doors, turn the lights off, close this building down if you don't believe that. He's still the answer. He's the answer to all the world's problems. He really is. I thank God he is. Jesus said in verse 16, they need not depart. And then he says to them, give them, give ye them to eat. Now that's an emphatic statement there. You notice what he said there? Give ye, you give them something to eat. Oh, my. Huh? Oh, my. Now, that statement ought to be written uh, everywhere, especially in the Lord's house. I'm thankful. That's a compelling desire of my heart. Yeah, I'm thankful. When we meet here together, God compels me to give you something from the Word of God. And I'm thankful I still got that desire to give you something from the Word of God. Oh, I'm telling you. I leave here on Sunday morning thinking, Lord, what do you want me to give them next? Huh? I'm telling you, something from the Word of God. 
I'm telling you, not just a little uh, candy stick or something, but I want to give you something good from the Word of God. I'm praying, asking God, what He wants me to give you? We have the bread of life to people. We ought to be able to give them something from the Word of God. You ought to be able to give something to the Word of God. I'll never forget to uh, dealing with uh, dealing with people. I better be careful here, but I, I'll never forget dealing with people in leadership. And I said, I ever one of us ought to be in the book. That's what I said to a group of folks in leadership. I said, I, I want to challenge you to get in the book, get in the book, get in the book. All of us get in the book. Let's study the Word of God. Let's read the Word of God together. I, I want to challenge you. Let's all get in the Word of God together. And I want to challenge you over these next few months that as we meet together, I'll tell you what I want us to do. Let's challenge each other. Where have you gleaned today in the Word of God? That ought to be our statement. I was preaching through the book of Ruth. I've done that here, preached through the book of Ruth. And I challenged our leadership that. Everybody in leadership that. I challenged. I said, just, you know, and I said, I'm not, I'm not being critical. I said, just. You know, from time to time, just to challenge each other. Say, hey, what have you gleaned from the Word of God this week or today? Or what, what, have you, what have you heard? Something spiritual. So think, start thinking spiritual. I had a fellow, I, I asked him a couple of times. And every time I'd ask him, oh, that's your job, preacher. You give me something spiritual. I thought, man, you in leadership and you ain't studying the Word of God? Boy, we in trouble. Oh, boy. I don't need you in leadership if you're trying to lead people spiritually and you're not in the Word of God. Huh? Hello. Uh, I found that to be true later too, boy. I'm telling you. Uh, I'm telling you. Uh, we got the bread of life. We ought to be giving it to somebody if it ain't nothing. But boy, I realize today how much Jesus loves me. I realize today how much God's blessing me. I realize today, boy. I'm telling you, the world's in trouble, preacher. <laughs> you ought to be able to see something from the lens of the Word of God. Read some verse every day. You ought to be in the Word of God every day. You ought to give them something to eat. I mean, people are hungry to know the truth of God's Word, to know the truth from God's Word. You ought to spiritually give them something to eat. John chapter 6, the Bible says, says Philip, now he was, the, he was the arithmetic guy. He was the accountant of the, of the uh, disciples. I mean, he was all the time figuring. You, 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 you notice that. If you study his life, you notice that's true. He was the one who's always managing. He was the one behind the scenes always figuring. And Philip answered, verse number 7 of John, chapter number 6. You see it up there. He said, 200 pennies worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may, what? Just take a little. Just have a little bite. <laughs> he got his calculator out and he went to figure. Counting this one over here and counting this one over here and divide them up. And he figured it all up. He said, if we split it up just right, why well, we if we had 200 pennies worth, and we ain't. But if we did, ain't good English, but he's an accountant. He said, well, why everybody wouldn't have wouldn't have enough for everybody just take a bite. Let's last well, feed them, Lord. Hmm. The problem was Philip left out a single ingredient the most important ingredient in the equation he left out the Lord when you leave the Lord out of the equation you mess up big time and that's what he done he left the Lord out of the equation and when you leave Jesus out of everything this old world's needs boy I'm telling you you're in trouble but when you leave Jesus in the equation you meet the needs Put Jesus back in the situation. Put Jesus in the problem. Put Jesus in your situation. You know what you'll find? Oh, you'll find a solution. Always. Think about the problem, your situation you got now. Put Jesus in the situation. Oh, put Jesus back in the presence. The Lord Jesus, I'm telling you, he could fix it. Oh, I'm telling you, he fixes fix it off. He can swing bees and the stars into space. He can fix your problem. I guarantee you, he can fix it. Oh, I'm telling you, it's like a man standing at the mouth of a river and saying, we ain't got nothing to drink. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, I'm telling you, it'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Huh? I don't care what the needs are. I'm telling you, those needs can be met as long as Jesus Christ is alive and he's alive forever. I'm telling you, he is. Verse number eight, the Bible says one of his disciples, Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. That's how he's referred to all through the scriptures. Just about every time you read about Andrew, he's in second, second place. Simon Peter's brother. 
But every time you read about him, boy, there's great statements about Andrew. Just about every time you read about him, almost, I think, every time, except maybe even once, it, it, it may be every time. You know what he's doing? He's bringing somebody to Jesus. Boy, how would you be like to be known as that? Always bringing somebody to Jesus. I'm telling you, in John's Gospel, chapter number 1, he brings his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. In John's Gospel, chapter number 6, he brings this little lad with a little lunch to the Lord. And later in the book of John, he's bringing some Greeks to Jesus, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Oh, yes, he's always bringing people to Jesus. Oh, what a statement. All Andrews ever did was just invite people to Jesus. That's the grandest work anybody can do is invite somebody to Jesus, bring somebody to Jesus. Oh, I'm telling you, you may not can play, play music like these ladies up, up here on the instruments. You may not can sing like the choir did this morning or like Brother Daniel, but i tell you what you can do. You can tell somebody about how you met Jesus, and you can invite them to meet Jesus. If you know him, you can. Well, I'm telling you. He said there's a little lad here in verse number 9 of John's Gospel, chapter number 6. There's a little lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. He says, but what are they among such many? Oh, but he's bringing him to Jesus. Oh, bring him to Jesus. Here's a boy. Doesn't seem like he has much. What are they? Small, minimized. Oh, don't seem like much. Oh, don't seem like the boy, the boy had much. You think this little boy? I'm telling you, when he left that morning, do you, do you think he 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 he, capt he think he captured in his mind what Jesus was going to do in his life that day? We we minimize what Jesus can do in our lives. You know what? You ever thought about it? You think about it every day. What Jesus might could do in your life today, if you give him what you got. A little as much. Oh, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You think about it. Here's a little boy. He's taking what he's got and he's willing to give it to Jesus. I'm telling you to feed 5,000. His, his mama maybe put those two little fish, and, and they are little, by the way. Little. When you read this in the scripture and you analyze what the Bible's saying right there, it's little fishes. Little fishes. And, and the little pieces of bread. And he's hopping off to see Jesus, and no doubt his mama's told him, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say. I try to imagine. I really do. I don't know if mama's with him or maybe mama sent him. Hey, but packed him a little lunch. I don't know. I have no idea. But I see what the Lord can do if somebody's willing to give it to the Lord. Now, that brings me to the second point of the master. And the Bible talks about the master here. Not only the multitude, but the master. You go back to the book of Matthew and you see here the, the five loaves and the two fishes. In verse number 17, and they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And you remember what Jesus said there? Bring them hither to me. Give them to me. Oh, are we willing to give what little we have to Jesus? Oh. Now what if the boy said, well, I'll give you one and one. That's about where we are. Uh-oh. I believe we'd been in trouble, wouldn't we? he just give it all. He's willing to give it all. Five loaves, five pieces of barley bread, two fishes. In the hands of Jesus. It's amazing what Jesus can do with a little, huh? Little as much when God is in it. Oh, I'm telling you, little as much. You may think it's a little, but if you're willing to give it all, just give it all to Jesus. Give it all to him. You say, I'm not much. Well, give it all to him. I can't do it. Oh, just give it all to him. It's amazing what God can do if you just give it all to him. Willing to give your all to him. We give the Lord on reservation, you know. I can't give it all to him. Uh, David took that slingshot. Oh, I wish you could have heard Brother Ken this morning. Brotherhood. Man, I'm telling you, outstanding job. David. With and that young boy showed up out there with the Philistines and the giant. That giant among them Philistines. And a little slingshot in the hands of David could kill a giant. Could kill a giant. Take down a giant in your life if you're willing to put it in the hands of God. Uh, take down the giants in your life if you're willing to put it in the hands of God and have faith. The Lord Jesus could take a, a jawbone of a donkey in the hands of Samson. One man, Samson, he could slay 
10,000 Philistines. Oh, yes, what? In the hands of one man. If you're willing to give it all to God. I'm telling you, here's a boy, a little lad with a little lunch. In the hands of the Lord. If you're willing to give it all to him. Oh, just give it all to him. He'll take it, and you know what he'll do? He'll break it. Now, I don't have time, but if I had time, I believe I could show you that Jesus will multiply if he'll break it. Sometimes he has to break us to multiply us, really use us. Oh, my, we don't like to be broken. Sometimes that's what it takes to really use us. Things have to be broken for the Lord to use them. Break down our pride, break down our prejudices, break down our positions sometime, huh? To really use us, to really, really get us to where we'll give it all to him. Oh, he broke it, he blessed it, he broke it. And he multiplied it. Oh, I remember hearing old Jerry Vines uh, preach many years ago. And he was talking about it. He's preaching to eight to 10,000 people every Sunday at his church when he retired. Eight to 10,000. I remember him telling that story just a, oh, just a few counties south of here when he began. 16 years, 17 years old, 18 years old. He said when he first went out to preach his first message, he said about eight people there. When he went to pastor his first church, there wasn't but a handful of people there. How God used him. He said, but I just give my all to God. Just give my all to God. Isn't that amazing? Oh, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about, I'm talking about how we give our all to God. I can tell you more stories of people like that. Give their all to God. Be willing to use by God. Oh, I'm telling you, how willing to use by God, make something out of us. Take nothing. Jesus can take nothing. He can make something out of it. Jesus can take a little and make much out of it. Oh, I'm telling you, Jesus can take this little lad's lunch and feed a multitude. I remember reading about the great violinist, <clears throat> Praganini. You ever heard of Praganini? The great violinist today has gone by. He was going to play before the aristocrats in the Royal Opera House. He's on stage. He's going to tune his violin days before application or anything else. And he starts tuning his violin. The Opera House is open. They open the curtains. He's there on stage fixing to play before the, all the aristocrats. And he starts tuning his violin. String broke. Well, they don't have time to go get another one. He's... So go and go get one, but he's still there. So he starts tuning the next string, and it breaks. He starts tuning the next string, and it breaks. He's down to one string, and he pulls it tight. Everybody's wondering. Hush comes over the whole crowd. What is he going to do? The shame. The embarrassment. Praganini. The great violinist. He pulls his bow, he pulls his violin, and he begins to play on that one string. Oh, and he began to play. And he kept playing. And he kept playing. Oh, and after a while, he brought down the whole house. Everybody stood and shouted and applauded at what he could do. Unbelievable, spellbound, almost breathless. The master violin with one string began to play heavenly music. People wept. People shouted. When it was all over, just one string on a broken violin. Why? Because it was in the master's hand. Can I tell you, that's what God can do with your life. That's what God can do with my life. I may be speaking to someone, feel like your life is what? Broken? <laughs> God can take it. How oh, he make beautiful music out of your life. He can make a beautiful song out of your life. Bring them to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down. And Mark says he divided them into, he divided them up into companies by fifties and hundreds. I tell you, our God is a God of order. He literally is. 
God is an organized God. He don't do things haphazardly. It's a reminder for you and I that we ought to do things in order, decently and in order. That's the reason we ought to be organized. You know, it's very important. I'm telling you, we ought to study. I was studying this past week. I brought a message Sunday, Wednesday night on on how to please God. And I was talking about the orders of of things. I brought brought out the fact of the the, the great chemist John Dalton and how he discovered the atom and how how orderly things are. God, even in creation, and even in the in the astronomy, how how God is so orderly, how all this thing is put together. The more you study, the more you realize God is a God of order. I mean, it's hard to be an atheist. You start looking at all this stuff. It really is. See how God has put all this together. I mean, really, faith. Hebrews chapter eleven, Bible talks about faith. There's a divine design in every facet of creation. Amen. Design, divine in every facet of creation. It's hard to be an atheist, boy, if you look at it from God's perspective, boy. Think about it. That's the way it ought to be. We ought to have an order. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Here's the last thing I'm done. The miracle. The miracle, verse number 19. He took the five loaves, he took the two fishes, and he looked it up toward heaven and he blessed it. The Bible says, James chapter 1, verse 17, Every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither the shadow of turning. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Boy, that's the kind of God we serve. You understand that the source of all of our blessing comes from heaven? Have you figured that out yet? Every good thing you've got come from God. Have you figured that out? Do you understand that everything you have come from heaven? Every good thing you've got come from heaven. you understand that every need he'll supply if you trust him? Every good gift comes from above. So Jesus lifted up his eyes toward heaven and he prayed. And God began to bless. And he began to break it. And he began to give it to his disciples. And they began to pass it out. He began to bless it and break it, and they began to pass it out. Mm-hmm. God multiplies, and he multiplies. He break it, and he blessed it, and he began to multiply it. Boy, I'm telling you. And they all did all eat, and watch this, were filled. They didn't all just get a bite. They were filled. Went out with a friend the other night, Friday night. And normally, Karen and I, we tried to do better. We, we, we'll try to order a uh, single entree and split it. Usually that's enough food for both of us. Well, Friday night I thought, well, you know, she wanted fish, I wanted steak. So I ordered steak, she ordered fish. <clears throat> Too much food. Man, that steak was good, brother. I tell you it was good. And I eat that whole thing. Brother Ed, I shouldn't have. Brother Johnny, I shouldn't have, Brother Dale. That's too much for me to eat, Brother Mick. But I enjoyed it. I was full. Filled. Good eating. Nothing like good eating, is there? You can tell I enjoy it. These folks were filled. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it it was good that day as a T-bone or a ribeye steak with mashed potatoes, gravy, what you like the best. I'm telling you, you fill in the blank there and banana pudding, banana split, whatever you want, all rolled up into one and no calories. Now, what I had the other night had plenty of calories. But this meal, I'm telling you, it was, it was heavenly, divinely touched by the Lord. I'm telling you, it was great. I'm satisfied with Jesus. Are you? We have something to give the world that will satisfy them. I'm satisfied. I've never been disappointed in him. There's been many times I'm sure he's been disappointed in him. Me, me but I've never been disappointed in him. I've never been disappointed in him. I've went to places people told me about eating. <clears throat> Boy, I can tell you a story there. <laughs> I won't. Time's sake. You ask me after church, I'll tell you. I'll be glad to tell you a story. But but I won't tell you. I've never been disappointed in him. I've never been disappointed. And the Bible said they took up the fragments. What was left over now when they passed it all out? That remained. They had leftovers. You like leftovers? Now, my wife don't care much for leftovers. I kind of like leftovers sometimes. 
I'm telling you, dude, you like leftovers? Some of you saying, I wish you'd get off food, preacher, I'm about to starve to death. I wish. You just keep on. Huh? I don't know how it was. I don't know who got the leftovers, 12 baskets of leftovers. Somebody says for each one of them doubt disciples. I don't know. I imagine, think about this, though. If they give one of them, give that little boy a basket full of them leftovers, and he went to carrying that home to Mama. Huh? Think about that. And he gets back to Mama. She packed this little, little boy, this little bitty lunch. And he comes home with a basket full of fragments left over. Where'd you get that, boy? And he's got to explain that. Lord, you're just not going to believe it, Mama. The Lord went to, took my little lunch. And he blessed it. And he broke it. And he passed it out. And he went passing out the bread. Can I tell you? Years ago when the boys were little, I was a bread man one time. Kern's bread. Run a bread route. Never forget it. Can I tell you, that's what all of us should be. Bread men, bread people. Passing out the bread of life everywhere we go. Used to give out samples. I had it worked out with my boss. I said, if I see somebody, a potential customer, can I give them a sample? He said, yeah, I'll work that out with you. i do it. Get them a Get them, get them hooked on something good. Man, they'll buy it. Hey, but with the Lord, he's already paid the price. Oh, I'm telling you, have you trusted the bread of life? Do you know the Lord as your personal Savior? Have you trusted him? I'm telling you, he's satisfying. He's satisfying. You, you, you ever start to go to bed one night and you're hungry? Maybe you eat early. You start to go to bed maybe about 10 o'clock. You get to hankering for that peanut butter and dill pickle sandwich maybe. I don't know. But whatever you're hungry for. I better watch it right there. I'll get in trouble. I want to tell you, the Lord is satisfied whatever you're hungry for. He'll satisfy the hunger of your soul. He really will. If you'll trust him. Have you trusted him as your only hope of heaven? If you hadn't, will you do it today? The moment we're going to stand, we're going to pray, and we're going to sing. If you've never trusted the Lord, will you come? Will you come and accept him as your personal Savior? I'll be glad to pray with you and help you. You can trust him as your only hope of heaven. He will. He'll save you. Let's stand for prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of your word today. Thank you for this great miracle you've done many years ago right here on planet Earth. And Lord, you're still the bread of life that's meeting needs hearts and lives today and you'll meet the needs of those that are trust you today i'm grateful and thankful you're still the same savior help folks to trust you today in jesus name amen we're standing we're singing